Are you ready to go to work? Yeah. I've thought of my, to myself, what can I share in 40 minutes that might make a difference? And so I'm going to give you some words, some vignettes, a few scriptures, and three or four stories that I think are being captured probably on camera, and also my grandkids will remind me later what I said. It's very important that you have a belief in yourself about what principles can make a difference in your life. The first principle that I became familiar with while I was with Jim, who by the way, none better, we, I, I, I'll give you your 10, you give me, yeah, okay, none better, but I want you to try to get a feeling of where I'm coming from. Because he invited me, I began to look back over an experience as being an entrepreneur. I've always made a living being an entrepreneur. There's only been about two periods in my life that anybody signed my paycheck. I always owned the companies that I was involved with. I started in, in, in high school as a young kid. But even more, in junior high, I learned if I could mow a good lawn, I could get $5. But if I learned if I hired four other guys, I could pay them $3 and get two. And that's when I started to build this idea of a concept. Then as I moved into high school, I was playing basketball. I was able to become the 13th man on a 12-man team. 12 players, 12 slots, 12 uniforms, and I then had a chance to go in and talk to the coach. And I said, would you just give me a chance? And so here's one of the first principles. If you never ask, the answer is always no. So I asked if I could get on the team. They gave me a uniform, different than the other 12. And I started to play. Didn't start one time during my sophomore year. Started a couple times in my junior year, and then I was starting in my senior year. But during that whole time, somebody told me I should continue to learn and focus on education, which I did. One night in my senior year, I was visited by some coaches from BYU. And when they came, it was one of those Cinderella nights. I played against a kid from Sacramento named Walt Torrance. Walt went on to become All-American, all everything at UCLA, went on to play with the Knicks and on and on and on. That night, I played out of my head. I had 20 points, about 11 rebounds, da da, and he had about nine points. Because of that, I received a full-ride scholarship to BYU, starting from when I asked the coach, could I become the 13th man? If you don't ask, the answer is always no. But also because I was focused on learning during that time, I came up with a scholastic full-ride scholarship. I had two. Because I learned that if you focus on a defined goal, is the only way you can achieve that goal. Goals. You're going to be learning more about that in your coming episodes next week and the week after. A goal and a wish. Wishes are sort of goals by some people, but they do not have any time frame, no steps, and no dates. A goal without dates of when I'll do it and steps to get it done are merely wishes. And there's that expression, if wishes were horses, then even the beggars of the world would ride because we all live in the world of wishes. One of the principles I learned very early and experienced along with Jim and others was the power of a promise. I promise you, I promise I will do it. My word is my bond would be the affirmative statement. Well, I want to show you a brief two and a half minute experience that I had with my two sons, Jefferson and David. Now, the Jefferson you're going to see here is the older of the two. He was 14. We went to the Barcelona Olympics. I had a goal of wanting my, to go somewhere with my children that were special. And I worked hard, 92. We were with Franklin, 
and I was able to make a few phone calls and got tickets. Now, the stadium only held 10,000 people, but it was going out to a billion people. And so we were on the 10th or 12th row right by Michael Jordan's parents and the directors of the NBA. Great seats. We saw the semifinals, the quarterfinals, and then we got down to the final game against Croatia. That's where this is going to pick up. Now, I'm going to tell you in advance, because I want to have it reinforced, that if you come away from this session today, I only want you to remember a few things. One is, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So you've got to always ask, can I? Is it possible? Could I? Should I? Let's do it. The other is, if you make a promise, the impact of making a promise, but then keeping the promise in a quick and timely way. As we went... On our trip, we went first to England, and my son, my younger son, kept saying, "Can I get a? I'm looking for an American flag." And his brother said, well, "Why would you want an American flag? We're in England." He says, "Well, because I want to hold it up so Mom can see me when I'm in Barcelona at the final game with Michael Jordan and Pippen and the great, great gr dream team." Then we went to France, no American flag. Then we went to Spain, no American flag, and so finally. Next to the last day, a fellow was sitting out on the curb selling American flags, and we bought the flag. He says, oh, now mom can see me. And he wrapped it around his shoulders, and we end up being in the final game on the 10th row, three seats from Michael Jordan's parents. The game comes down to the end. Looked like when it started that we could have lost the game, but finally John Stockton came down and made a few of those shots. And we won. Five minutes before the game ended, a smart, clear-eyed young woman came right up the aisle, walked right up here, and I'm on the aisle, and David's here, and my other son's here, and she said, could I ask a special favor of you? I notice you're wearing an American flag. Michael Jordan is under contract with Nike, but all the uniforms that are being passed out are with Reebok, and so we can't show their label. Could we borrow your flag? Now, when you ask a 12-year-old boy if Michael Jordan, the greatest player that ever lived, could borrow his flag to put over his shoulder in the final gold medal ceremony, what do you think David said? Oh, yes! She takes the flag off him, wraps it up, and then she reached down and grabbed a piece of wrapper for a sandwich, and she said, let me get your name. What is your name? David Peterson. What is your address, David? This is right in the middle. People are going crazy. And then she rolled it up, put it in her blue coat that said USA Basketball, and she says, David, I promise you I will get your flag back. And he goes, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Takes off, goes down. The final gold medal game wraps up, and then they have the ceremony. Well, because I'm only going to tell it once, and then I'll show it, it's two minutes, I want you to remember this in your mind. When she promised, everyone from that point on, as we went home on the train to Paris and then flew home, said, you'll never see the flag again, kid. But she promised. And then going home, he turned to me and says, Dad, what do you think? And I said, what do you think, Dave? She said, well... She just looked like someone I could trust. And she says, I promise. I says, you'll get your flag back. So we go home. We're home for one week to the day from when we flew out. And here comes a Federal Express truck around the circle. And lo and behold, a kid hops out and says, I'm looking for David Peterson. He says, I'm David Peterson taking his earphones off as he's mowing the lawn, listening to the Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> so he takes the earphones off, and he goes, I'm David Peterson, and his brother over on the side, is, who had been just ribbing him the whole time and saying, why do you want an American flag? Why do you want an American flag? And now here's a box. He opens the flag, and in there is the flag he gave to her with a surprise. Can you roll the film? Roll the film. We're good. No, we're good. Lights down. Lights off. Lights 
Anderson of Salt Lake City got the opportunity of a lifetime this summer as they accompanied their dad to the Barcelona Olympics. They saw the sights of Spain and came home with a great pin collection of souvenirs of the trip. But 13-year-old David Peterson came home with just a bit more. The story begins as David, Jeff, and Father Bob are in the stands watching the Dream Team in the gold medal game. Five minutes before the game end, uh, a girl by the name of Joanne Scott came up and said, can we borrow your flag for Michael Jordan? And so she won the flag and she wrote down David's name on a piece of paper. We stuck it in her pocket and she took off. The U.S. team went on to win that game and David wondered where his flag would wind up. But minutes later, it all made sense to him. Five minutes later, uh, Michael Jordan came out with the flag over his shoulder in the gold medal ceremony. And David said, look, Dad, that is my flag, and Michael's got it. He was just beside himself with excitement. Jordan, Charles Barkley, and David Robinson wore the flags to cover the Reebok logo on their team warm-up jackets. All three players are under contract to Reebok's competitor, Nike. The Petersons returned home to Salt Lake without the flag, but the story didn't end there. A week later, a Federal Express truck dropped a package off at the house, and it was then David really got excited. I mean, Jeff opened the box and uh, saw that the whole dream team had signed the flag. The flag will wind up framed on David's wall, and he'll have quite a story to tell his children and grandchildren. But for his dad, Bob, who works for Salt Lake's Franklin Quest, the experience is much bigger than that. A promise made and a promise kept. And for me, as a, as a businessman, I just realized the importance of customer service. Here's a case that came home from the Olympics. Think of all the things we had going on for him. And he could at any point say, well, we send the flag back to the kid. They write a letter, they get it signed, and they send it back to him within one week. That's a home run. That, that, that's a, that's a three-pointer all the way. Steve Brown, Utah Jazz Broadcasting. Well, the flag is downstairs in a special case in our home. David enjoyed it for a number of years. And about five years ago, David, the younger one there, uh, died in an accident. So he's not here to enjoy it, but the memory, of, with, along with our total eight children, lingers strong. His brother, who was there, has now moved ahead with his life, received his degree, got his MBA, and became a sort of another generation entrepreneur. He now heads up and leads a company called Del Sol. Del Sol has done hundreds of million dollars of sales. We now have 150 stores throughout uh, the Caribbean and elsewhere, all from an idea. So everything really worthwhile begins with an idea. Now, I think when you came in, if you didn't, we'll, we'll find out we will ask you to come up and ask afterwards. But every one of you should receive, have received a Del Sol starfish. Starfish story is famous to you. You know about it. The boy on the beach where the old man says, what are you doing, kid? And he says, I'm, I'm saving starfish. He said, but there's a million of them here on both sides. You can't save them. You can't make a difference. And the kid reaches down and picks up one starfish, throws it across the waves outward, and he says, but it'll make a difference to that one. Lives are changed, one starfish, one life at a time. Now, when every morning you get up today, you're watching the headlines or you're watching them on your computers about what's happening in Sendai and elsewhere. Today, the headlines where the radiation is going up in the reactors over there. Now, let me go a little bit forward and also backwards. I have to give you a, a philosophy that's a part of my life, has always been a part of my life, and I know you see it every time whether Jim, Richie, or Carolyn, or their family even talks to you, and that is, these are the best times to be alive. It's not just a talk from an entrepreneur saying that. I'm saying to you that you need to make plans as though you're going to live for an eternity, you will have a long life on this earth. You will marry, go to the temple, serve missions, come back. You're just going to live. But, but Brother Peterson, what about all the bad things that have been going on in the world? Bad things have always been going on in the world. That's the nature of the world. But the times in which you're living today, 
I, I just have to look into your eyes and speak to you heart to heart are the best times this earth has ever had. Now, once in a while, because I have 28 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren and eight children, the question is, what about the future? I said, believe in the future. Now's the time to prepare. There's never been a better time in the history of the world in order to start a business, to get married, to build a family, or to serve a mission. This is the greatest time in the world to do that. No question about that. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that the headlines have nothing to do with your future altitude. Your attitude determines ultimately your whole life the altitude to which you will achieve. There was a story that was a famous and favorite story of President Hinckley, and it was Charles Dickens who wrote it in 1700s, The Tale of Two Cities. The conclusion was it was the story of London and the story of Paris, and it was a terrible time, a horrible time. But Brother Peterson, what's happening now compared to them? Today is beautiful compared to them. What about the people of Sendai? It's a horrible time for them. The death toll is almost at 3,500, 4,000. It might reach 10,000. But let me see, 10,000. That's about two weeks of how many people die of lung cancer from smoking or cancer, just from anything else. Today is the best time for you to be alive. Well, the best of times and the worst of times. I'd like to suggest to you that you should consider a couple of scriptures that might remind you of some principles that might help you as you make plans. The first one would be D&C 130. There's a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundation of this world. All blessings and all laws relating to business and success, success is based upon true principles. And those principles are found deeply embedded in the gospel of Jesus Christ and an extension of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'd like to suggest to you that when I say that promises made, a promise kept, makes a difference in your life, and if you don't ask, the answer is always no. I'm also going to suggest to you that you might consider that... that the Spirit of God will be found in your life if you seek it and you ask for it. You must seek it and you must ask for it. What I'm doing now is I'm having a wonderful experience in the last little while preparing for today that I realized that I was also writing my, my history One of the things that always happens whenever we have any of our people come out of our stores and they walk outside, which you will when you walk outside in the sunlight and hold up your keychain, it will turn a brilliant color. In most cases, the, the guys will change blue and the girls will turn into a beautiful red. The word that always comes out of people's mouths are, wow, wow, say it with me. Wow! And when you say that, I want you to think of three words and three expressions. One, wow. W stands for worthy. O stands for obedient. And W stands for willing. A couple of words that may make a difference to you. Some people refer to them as the magic seven words. I've used them over my life, and the first two words are three. Up until now, up until now, 
whatever's occurred in your life is now history. Up until now, what's occurred in your life is now history. The best example probably would be the example of the rearview mirror and the windshield. The rearview mirror captures your past in a little example up here, and the windshield represents everything that's important to you as far as your future is concerned. No question about it. Up until now, the next two words are, that's good. When something occurs in your life, no matter what it is that occurs, no matter what it is, you should begin by saying, well, that's good. Because if it's good, it's something you can't change anyhow. You go with what comes to you and build from there. And then something that I think has helped me a lot, and that is the example of how we talk to ourselves, our self-talk. Self-talk. What is self-talk? When we say something, we don't even know how it's sounding to somebody else. I'm going to say something, and the two words I'm going to suggest to you would be, sure enough. Say it with me. Sure enough. Now watch. I have a hard time studying the scriptures. I often get sleepy and fall asleep. I don't understand, particularly the Old Testament. Now let's turn it around. I love the scriptures. Why, when I read, my mind opens up. Sure I love learning the words of the prophets. Sure so up until now is what's happened in the past. That's good is whenever something's occurred, you have to take the affirmation saying that is the best, and you go with it. And then up, sure enough, is the affirmation of how you are sounding to yourself. One of the wonderful experiences that I learned early on was saying the words to myself, why not, let's do it. In high school, my family uh, were modest income people. They didn't have a lot of money, and yet everybody around me in my high school always seemed to dress so nicely and have nice clothes and so forth. I decided I got to figure out a way how can I dress a little nicer? How can I overcome the problem that I didn't have a lot of money? An idea came to me. Now we're in an entrepreneurial setting. I'll suggest to you three quick stories. One is, I got the idea that if I could get a clothing store in town to sponsor me, I could make some money and probably wear great clothes. So I went to high school, talked four or five of my buddies into cleaning their lockers out and turning their lockers into my showrooms. So I went to the clothing store, and there I decided to get all the clothes and sweaters and shirts if possible and bring it to school. And during recesses and elsewhere, I began to sell out of my locker. Well, I became the best dressed student in high school. My two younger brothers coming along couldn't ever wear the shirts that I had in my racks at home, and I made a fair amount of money. Now that got me going and thinking that I needed to just plan ahead if I wanted to have some extra funds, even as I prepared to save money to go on a mission, which I did. And I went to Australia on a mission. While I was in Australia on a mission, because I had worked pretty hard before I went going to BYU, I was getting overrides or commissions on the people that I had hired while I was down there. And then I had a roommate. His name was Sherm Day towards the latter part of my mission. Sherm Day was a choice missionary companion. He went on to be among the top four guys for the Atlanta Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia. We sat together and contemplated that we figured out we had on our mission an enormous amount of talent in basketball. We talked to the mission president, and the mission president says, I like the idea. We says, President, if we can go on a 25-game schedule twice, if it won't cost the church anything, and if we can pass out hundreds of books of Mormon and work with all the missionaries in the local area, would you support us? He says, go for it and do it. I got Volkswagen of Austral Asia to provide the, the, the uh, van, the basketball uniform. We looked like globetrotters, only we're Mormon Yankees. And out of that came the story, 
from Australia called the Mormon Yankee basketball team. And I think there'll be a special coming out one of these days you'll see after conference relating to the experience of why not, if you have an idea, think of the idea, write the idea down, create the steps, and then go for it. My wife is one of the great puzzle putter togethers in the world. And she can lay out a 2,000 piece puzzle on our wonderful dining room table and then can begin. A puzzle represents to me like the, all the questions you have about your own lives in the future. You have many questions. What should I study? What should I do? Who should I go out with? Questions of honor and not honor. Questions of how you should live your life are always facing you every day. And so if I ever wanted to sort of get her and have fun with her, what do you think I would hide? The lid. Because the lid of every puzzle shows the whole goal by which you are striving to put those puzzle pieces together. And once you have the lid, you're able to put the parameters in going around the edges. I would always try to hide the puzzle for a little while, but I loved her and she knew I would always, where's my lid, Bob? Where's my lid? <laughs> so I would bring the lid back in and she'd put the puzzle together. So one of the things you have to decide in your life and I have to decide in my life, even a young life now, I have many, many years to go. My plan is to outlive Jim. That'll take me well into my hundreds. I plan, <laughs> I plan to, definitely plan to do that. But when I decided to have a goal, so while we're on this trip and we're away, we've been writing down goals. What do we want to accomplish by the end of this year, next year? Two or three years from now, do we want to continue to live in our home? What do we want to do about this? What are we going to do about that? I'm saying that goal setting is a continuous, long-term, forever process. If you think that it's something that is offered to you by leaders who are trying to get you to think more positively about the future, that is true because it's the future is where you're going to live your whole life from, from this point forward. Okay, another principle. Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm makes all the difference as to how you live life. Nobody likes to live or hang around with a grump in marriage or dating or anywhere else. If you ask me the question sitting in front of you, Brother Peterson, Brother Bob, Captain Bob, what would you recommend as the one thing I should look at, one thing I should look at that ultimately will make a difference in my life and my future life, married with a family. And I would say, obviously, the wow principle, worthy, W, O, obedient to principles, and W, willing to do the best you can, it would be the principle of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, the whole word is a Greek origin that says God within, entheos, God within, enthusiasm. If you have to look at yourself and say, how much enthusiasm do you have towards life and towards living the gospel? God within will make that difference. Entheos. There is a scripture that's so powerful, so beautiful. I think of it whenever I feel like I might be in a grumpy time, but which I try to avoid. And that is in Revelation 3 and 15, God said, I know thy works, because thou art neither cold nor hot. But since thou art neither cold or hot, but thou art lukewarm, I spew thee out of my mouth. I want you to know that the whole principle of enthusiasm is the basis for you to look forward to your life. Now let's go back to the tale of two cities. Those were horrible times. The Second World War was a horrible time. 
you talk about the things that are going on in your life. If you, if you sat with me, if my grandchildren sat with me, and you wanted me to share with you my hope for you for the future, as you leave this meeting, leave this afternoon together, it's the best time in the history of the world to be alive. If I had a chance to come back or come to the earth for the first time and find myself here at 19, 20, 21, 23, 25 years of age, this is the time I would want to be on the earth. I've never seen greater opportunities for making money, for raising a family, for learning about life. This is the greatest time in the history of the world for being on this earth. If you read the headlines, you can become depressed. Only be respectful. We can say our prayers and bless for the people in Sundai and the reactors, but you know what? They'll get past it. The reactors will cool down. They will rebuild them, and life will move ahead. What, Brother Peterson, then, should be our focus? Focus on you. Focus on your righteousness. Focus upon living the commandments of God because the commandments of God are an absolute basis for a happy life. Money is not a happiness issue, except if you don't have enough. But if you set entrepreneurial plans to build a business, to be better in your business, you can be an entrepreneur starting from scratch to build a business, or you can be an entrepreneur where you become someone who is gifted and expansive in helping people in the business that you work in. People love entrepreneurs, and they also love entrepreneurs. Brother Richie and Carolyn and his associates that come here, we somehow have been very blessed over the years because we begin to see that we can take an idea, we can take some capital, ours were initially borrowed, and then get together with good people and then have a worthy purpose with enthusiasm, with trust, with hope. And in that process, we can build a very solid and secure life. One of the great experiences that I had over the years was I was a priest quorum advisor. And over a period of, period of time, I had 32 priests. And over the 32 priests' life, over a few years, it ended up that 31 of them served missions. That was our goal, 31 out of 32. But the metaphor that we use was scuba diving because we could say to them, if you follow the rules of scuba diving, you will live, you will soar, and you will have a magnificent experience. I'll always, I'll always promise them that when they would go a night dive with us, it would be 11 or 12 o'clock at night, Dark, but down below, the plankton would soak up all of the color from a whole day. And then we would go down and we would crack one of those little light sticks and stick it behind our tanks. I was a pretty good scuba diver, but we had a couple of master divers that went with us. And we used that, the light, the light stick, as like following the, the path of the Savior. And so we would take them down, we would swim, after about 30 minutes or so, black, 11 o'clock at night, we would come right up to the side of the ship because we trusted for 30 minutes following the light of the Savior, following the light of our dive master. Well, one of the rules that we taught them from the very beginning, that is when you're scuba diving, there's one important rule. Never, ever stop breathing. When you're under the water, no matter what you do, if you get into trouble, keep breathing. If you are overwhelmed by something that comes out of the blue, never stop breathing. I've been down with kids where the kelp would come around, the kelp, and it would wrap around our legs, and they would start to panic, and I'd swim right up to them, and I would just go calm, and I'd go try to give them a smile. It's pretty hard to smile through a mask, but I could. <laughs> Take my mouthpiece out and smile. Come on, you, you can do it. I know you can do it. Don't die on me. The bishop will, will never forgive me if I let you die out here. And so I would get him to settle down, and I would say, breathe. 
breathe. Now, some kids breathe so fast, they empty their tanks out. So I would come up and put my arm around them, and then I would breathe, make sure I had plenty of air, and I'd take it out and put it in their mouth. I'd go, go ahead, share my light, my air. I'm thinking, if he takes too much, maybe we'll both die. So I put it, <laughs> so I put it back in, back and forth. Never lost a kid. I'd been down 40, 50 feet with kelp all around us, and then, lo and behold, I would remind them again, never stop breathing. Okay, the metaphor. And you can read it on your own and sort of smile as you go through it. The second Nephi... The 32nd chapter. It is glorious. It is an entrepreneurial promise that if you will read it and get over into the latter verses and it will say, you must never stop praying. That the evil one teaches the man not to pray, but teaches him that he must not pray. So I would say the metaphor would be this. You will have hard times. We have lost a son. That was hard. But you have to pick your hand card up, no matter what happens. A disappointment in life, and you must keep going. We as a young couple have been on trips. Catherine's gotten very sick, wondered what we were going to do. And it would have probably been late, late at night, and I'm down rattling in Venice trying to find a pharmacy because I felt so priesthood-oriented that I wanted to give her a blessing, but I didn't have any consecrated oil. So finally I found somebody, and they came, and I got some oleo de oliva. And I went back up to our little apartment. I blessed the oil, gave her a blessing, didn't know what was going to happen. We were 10 days from our regular schedule to go home, and blessed her, and I kissed her, and we prayed together, and we cried together. Next morning, she felt great, and we stayed and went home, and two weeks after we got home, she had a miscarriage. I remember that experience so clearly because you must continue to always believe and always live positively, knowing that the future will always bring you the very thing that you are seeking. I bought a business one time. It's on the thing out here it says Magic Mill and Bosch. I bought a business one night. It was called Magic Mill. I bought it up in Filer, Idaho, and it was about probably 7 or 8 o'clock at night. They took the first inventory in history. I signed off on it. I became the owner. I met the employees, about 40 of them, got in my car and drove home. By 1 o'clock in the morning, lo and behold, the building, from a phone call from my manager that I hired out of the New York Times, said it was burning down. My business that I'd owned for six hours was burning down, and I realized, just as he was telling me over the phone, that I had no insurance. I had no insurance. And the business is going to the ground. And my first thought was, well, you didn't really like the floor plan of what we were going to have, You were complaining about where the paint booth was. This is now 2.30 in the morning. I said, I just can't get in my car right now, Dale, and go back up there. So please make sure you go over to Kentucky Fried Chicken. I think they're open. The volunteer fire department, get them donuts and whatever you can. Get the fire out, and I'll see you tomorrow. Next morning, went back up. It was smoldering. This beautiful business. I looked at it like this. It was about two feet tall, the whole business. And I said, well, we'll just rebuild, and then we'll start to sell, do the best we can. Fast forwarding, three years went by. We had no insurance, and the banks backed us up and supported us. Jim knows what that's like. 1976, a few years later, three years later, another major fire out in the back. Somebody has been changing oil back there, and the brush fire started, and the fire truck came with an amateur, and he blew the flames right into our building and set it up. Almost a million-dollar fire. We had perfect insurance, perfect photographs, perfect everything. No matter what happens in your life, pick up your hand cart and keep moving forward. No matter what disappointment occurs, Brother Peterson, I just feel like I've come to the end of my rope. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
your rope has no end. When things are really hard and tough and black, there will always be a tomorrow when the sun will come up and your hope will be rekindled. I want you to know that. Life will go on and it will get better and better and better and that is a promise to you. Well, let me conclude. It's a perfect time to conclude because it's the end. I have a metaphor. Brother Peterson, oh, you're that tall fellow from, from Del Sol. Del Sol. It's right on there. DelSol.com. Look it up on your internet. Never realize how powerful that is. Wonderful company. It was started by Deborah's husband. And I became the financier of it. And it started from one little cart in Salt Lake City to where now we have 1,000 employees. We're in every port in the Caribbean. We're all over the place. And my son Jefferson bought us and bought it, bought it out. But the metaphor here is you don't know how when you go outside, this will change color in the sunlight. You don't know how it happens. But it happens you don't know for sure how the Holy Ghost will buoy up your enthusiasm. But he does. And the future is very, very bright. So I've given you a few points. Let me give you my initials to my name. R-G-P. At DelSoul.com. I would invite you to send me an email. Of the five points representing the five points of the starfish of what you seem to grasp that made a difference to you today. Five points. Write me. You can copy Brother Richie. And then I will give him a little something to give to you because you did it. But do it within 48 hours. After 48 hours, my name will be like an old newspaper going down the road. Oh, Brother Peterson, he was that tall fellow with the big arms. I remember that. Yes. Now, here's the metaphor I want to leave you with. This represents Brother Ritchie and the prophets and the leaders and the president of the school and your parents. Oh, by the way, when was the last time you sent a letter? Emails work, but letters are so precious today because they're so rare. And tell your parents how much you love them, how grateful you are. Gratitude is the best dose of positiveness in the world. But this is us. We're always trying to come and trying to, get to light a fire under you. We're trying to bear testimony to you. That's all I've been doing while I've been here today. I just want you to, to tell you that these are the best of times. The future is wonderful. If you make and keep promises, you're going to be better off than if you don't consider that. Now, I'm going to try this. This is what? Us. The world is trying to light a fire under you. Is that true? And we try day in and day out. The Lord tries day in and day out. And all you do sometimes, and I do, is just be amused by the process. And then, lo and behold, one day, one afternoon, one night, one morning, on your knees, the Holy Ghost puts a clear spiritual stamp upon your spirit. And the miracle takes place. The miracle takes place. Now, don't worry. My hands are, are absolutely immune to this. I've only been burned half a dozen times. I want you to think that the future is represented by this sparkler. This is your future. This is what your marriage is going to be like. You who are still planning now to go on. Your mission is going to be like light up the mission field. Come back and light up your life. This is who you really are. This is all we are. But look what happens when you decide to make a difference to yourself by listening to the whisperings of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.